Governor, thank you for joining us today. And Governor Hutchinson, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Well, thank you, Bill. And I want to express appreciation to the NGA for hosting this summit, but also uh, uh, Administrator Jane Garvey uh, for being the uh, key moderator of it, but my fellow governors for uh, taking the time and trouble to talk about uh, this important issue facing our states in the coming in the coming years. There's probably not a more important and timely panel discussion than this summit on infrastructure. And uh, I appreciate each of you being there. Thanks for leading the effort in your states and leading the discussion today. I'm very proud of the NGA, that the NGA stood tall and supported the bipartisan infrastructure bill that made it through all the roadblocks and was signed into law. Those who criticize this investment say that only a portion of it goes to highways and bridges. Well, I, I know there are parts that I don't agree with in the bill, but Congress wisely broadened the definition of infrastructure. As governors, we have to increase investments in water projects, in broadband, in power infrastructure, cybersecurity, and airports. And that is today's world. And the breadth of the investment from this bill is a positive and not a negative. The bill emphasizes planning. As states, we need to share ideas and best practices on the best way to include the private sector and public partners in the best strategy for investment of these funds. We are starting the process here in Arkansas, but we have time to get it done because of the length of this investment and the impact of this bill. I know that the NGA will be helpful as a vehicle to guide us on best practices. And I am delighted to learn from the other governors on this panel as to what's happening in your states and your plans uh, for this infrastructure funding. I'll make a couple of additional comments before I do the uh, formal introductions. Uh, I looked at the ARPA funds that came, and in Arkansas, we had $1.5 billion. And I thought that would be sufficient to get us uh, with all the investment we needed in rural broadband and our water projects. But the ARPA funding, from our standpoint, was diverted to deal with the consequences of the Delta variant. Uh, at a time when I was looking at $1.5 billion, I thought we had adequate resources, but the variant and the resources we had to put toward hospital staff and other health needs depleted uh, those ARPA funds. And so for that reason, uh, the infrastructure funds that are now flowing are gonna be even more critically important to help us to get to where we need to be in real broadband and these other investments. The other point I would make is just simply the national significance of this uh, bill itself. Uh, before the bill passed, we had the uh, bridge, the I-40, Interstate 40 bridge over the Ar Mississippi River between Tennessee and Arkansas. It was closed for two months, months because an inspection revealed a critical fault uh, in, the, uh, in the bridge. It had to be closed for safety, and that disrupted our supply chain enormously, even before Christmas got here. And so it just illustrates the need for this investment, the inspection of our bridges, and that they cross state lines, and that this infrastructure bill will help us to get to where we need to be in terms of supporting these efforts. Let me come back to uh, our guest today. And I am so delighted, Jane, to see you again. Uh, Jane Garvey is a global chairman of Meridian uh, Infrastructure but I knew her in public service. Ms. Garvey served as the 14th Administrator, the Federal Aviation Administrator from August of 1997 to August of 2002. She was the first FAA Administrator to serve a full five-year term and the first female to lead the agency. Not only did she lead the agency for five years, but during the, some of the toughest times imaginable, she led the FAA through the preparations for Y2K uh, and Jane and I share a common experience. She led the FAA during and after the September 11 attacks. And there was not a tougher job to have responsibility for our 
bringing back our flights uh, after that 9-11 attack. I saw her in action and she could lead under pressure. Her awards of distinction include designation as one of 100 heroes in aviation history as part of the first flight centennial celebration in Kitty Hawk. And that's pretty cool, Jane. So good to see you and thank you for moderating this panel. And then Governor Larry Hogan, as has already been introduced as my, as previously serving as NGA chair and did an outstanding job. He was elected governor of Maryland in 2015. He was overwhelmingly reelected to a second four year term with the most votes of any gubernatorial candidate in Maryland. He's the only the second, he's only the second Republican governor to be reelected in the 242 year history of the state. And I want to recognize his leadership on infrastructure as well, because that was the, his chair's initiative while he was the NGA chair. And then we have uh, Governor John Bell Edwards. Uh, John Bell, uh, I want to thank you for hosting me in your absence for the LSU Arkansas game. Uh, that was. I want to thank you for beating us too there. <laughs> you were very kind and. Uh, so proud of your service, uh, John Bell, 56th governor of Louisiana. He was reelected in 2019. And I'll have to say uh, he was uh, reelected in a red state, which means you're a powerhouse there. And uh, uh, he's had a distinguished career. I love that he graduated from West Point in 1988, accepted a second uh, commission as second lieutenant in the US Army, had eight years of active duty, he earned the Airborne Ranger and Jump Master status and commanded a rifle company in the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg. But I also say that uh, he has some of the best laying hens uh, at his governor's residence and a great garden, and uh, I got to enjoy them all. So thank you, John Bell. And then uh, we're really honored to have Governor Lulion Guerrero, the ninth governor of Guam, the first woman elected governor. She began her political career in 1994 she, when she was elected to the Guam legislature. As a senator, the governor served as majority leader and chairman of the Committee on Rules and the Committee on Health. Uh, she wrote legislation that created Guam's Healthy Futures Fund and banned smoking in restaurants and bars. She's a registered nurse. She supported initiatives that increased salaries for nurse salaries and uh, delighted to have her join us today. And then we have Governor Tom Wolf. Uh, Tom, I haven't been able to see you lately very much, so great to have you on this panel, and I appreciate your leadership and participation in the NGA. He was elected uh, Pennsylvania's 47th governor in January of 2015. On his first day in office, he signed a gift ban that prohibited administration employees from accepting gifts from lobbyists. Before he became governor, Tom bought his family business, the Wolf Organization, which distributes lumber and other building products in more than quintupled in size under his leadership. Tom donates his salary to charity and refuses a state pension. Would everyone join in welcoming the panelists and I'll turn it over to Jane Garvey. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Governor. And uh, it's wonderful. I have to say, this is a real privilege uh, to be on this stage and to be moderating a panel of uh, such distinguished leaders. And uh, uh, I know it's going to be a very timely, and it is in fact a very, very timely discussion. Uh, I loved some of the comments that I heard today uh, and unprecedented. Imagine hearing that about transportation and infrastructure, unprecedented funding. Governor Hogan, I loved your comment about a generational mission. This allows us to really move forward on a generational mission. And that's something I think we don't wanna lose sight of. So that's uh, wonderful as well. But we also know that as uh, while this bill is being greeted with enthusiasm and with hope, the real work lies ahead. Uh, transforming all of that uh, aspirational legislative language into real uh, projects, into real tangible benefits for the American people really rests uh, with the states, with the territories, and with the governors who are sitting on this stage and their colleagues throughout the United States. The real work begins in the states and the territories. And the implementation 
of all of that, uh, those wonderful program, programs really lies ahead. So today's session gives us an opportunity to hear from some of the governors, uh, both the challenges uh, that they're facing, how they're thinking about uh, implementation, and what their priorities might be. So I am very eager, as I know so many of you are, to really hear from the governors. And we're gonna start, if we could, with, uh, with, with uh, Governor Hogan, and, and then just uh, simply move down to all the governors. I told the governors before, I think I have the easiest job of this day because uh, this is a wealth of information and ideas here, and I know we're all eager to hear it. So Governor Hogan. Well, thank you very much, Jane. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, putting this together. I wanna to thank everybody for participating. I'm very pleased to have my fellow governors here in Annapolis. I wanna thank the NGA for hosting it here. And I thank everybody for all of their incredible work to get us to this point, not only for the summit, uh, but with getting the bipartisan infra infrastructure bill done. I know a lot of people in this room had a lot to do with that. Um, and we're, I think, you know, really excited to be at this point after decades of, of uh, really people in both parties saying it was a top priority. We never really seemed to make that progress in Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, we finally, uh, you know, got it done. And I think it's going to be a game changer. It is going to, it is going to enable us to move forward on a lot of transformational projects. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess we're still waiting for more guidance from the federal government, which I probably had some discussions about that already uh, today. And I'm sure we'll be talking about more tomorrow. So we don't know the exact timing and exactly what strings are gonna be attached to what portions of the money. Um, it's the devil is in the details, but there's no question that it's gonna enable us to do a lot more for our states and working together uh, regionally to get things done uh, for, for our state. You know, we talked earlier about, we've been really focused on infrastructure. Our great transportation secretary uh, is right here in the front. I think you heard from him earlier today. Um, we, we've been really getting a lot done both with, you know, you know, re resurfacing 85% of our entire state highway system, building bridges, fixing bridges. We worked across the aisle with our, our uh, neighbor, Governor Northam on a, on a new American Legion bridge to connect the, the two states together, you know, huge improvements at airports, Port of Baltimore. We're, we've already made a lot of progress um, and we've kind of moved forward on the top priority projects in every one of our 24 jurisdictions for seven years. But there's certainly a lot of other things in the pipeline. And this additional federal funding is, um, while we haven't made final decisions about how to spend every penny of it, it's gonna enable us to now complete the entire state highway system uh, not 85%, but 100% before I leave office uh, at the uh, January of 23. We're going to get that done, right, Mr. Secretary? <laughs> See well, every, every state highway is going to be resurfaced, but we're going we're gonna to try to move forward on some of these big projects, but also move forward on a lot of other things, and not just in transportation, but with our water systems, with you know resiliency efforts, things that we're doing to protect the Chesapeake Bay. I think it's going to be transformational, and I'm anxious to hear uh, from, from my fellow governors about uh, some, some of their ideas and thoughts on what they're going to use it for. I'm anxious to, looking forward to the discussion here yeah. uh, about specifics of the deal. And hopefully, you know, we'll all know a little bit more. I guess our budget guys and are, are thinking that we're really not going to see the money until next year and exactly when and exactly how much when. You know, it's, it's tough to make final decisions. We do infrastructure planning like years in advance. Uh, so we'll find a way to utilize every penny that we receive and we'll put it to good use. Exactly how we're going to do that, I think, is it's not quite decided. Thank you, Governor Edwards. Thank you, Jane. And Larry, it's great to be in the great state of Maryland. Although being a West Point graduate and an Army veteran, yeah. this close to <laughs> yeah. the Naval right. Academy and this close to the Army Navy game, I yeah. feel a little bit no, like I'm behind no. enemy lines. Well, well, we're we're happy for your service, even I'm, though you didn't yeah. make it to the Naval Academy. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I was about to sign, Larry. I didn't apply. Uh, but I am rep I'm representing uh, West Point here today because I Thank felt you. like I needed to. And just for the record, there I wouldn't a, wear that out later as you're going around you know, downtown. There was a beautiful portrait of Roger Stallback in my room at this hotel. And I want you to know the Sharpie mustache was on there before I got in the room. I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. Um, That's good. No, th this is a this is a great topic, and and I will tell you there's so much in the bill to like, especially if you're from Louisiana, where you're the most challenged state in the country when it comes to climate change and coastal land loss. Two thousand miles of coast lost since 1930. That's a football field an hour on average. 
Um, so resiliency means everything to us. We've had five hurricanes in the last two hurricane seasons, two of which were tied for the strongest to ever make landfall in Louisiana. And we're, we're still suffering greatly. And when we do build back, we always try to build back better. But if you don't have the resources to do it, it's mostly talk. Uh, we are going to have some opportunities to do that. We're, we're excited. A third of our people don't have broadband, either because they don't live in an area where it's available, they can't afford it if they do, or maybe they lack digital literacy skills or the devices. All of that is going to be addressed uh, to a degree that would not have been possible, but for this infrastructure uh, bill. And we're excited about that. Uh, there, there's money there to plug orphaned wells, to, to uh, which we have more than our fair share of those, oil and gas wells. Uh, methane emissions uh, are, are occurring because of that. Uh, we're going to be able to do that. But roads and bridges, uh, $6 billion over five years, that's about a little over 20% increase of what we would normally get from the formula. A little less than uh, uh, $5 billion of that will be for roads and about a billion a little more for, for bridges. And that's really important for us uh, in Louisiana where Unfortunately, despite our very best efforts, we've got about a 13, 14 billion dollar backlog in necessary infrastructure improvements. Um, and and the, the work there is, is, uh, is multimodal. Uh, the Mississippi River is one of the biggest uh, advantages we have when we try to compete, uh, not just with other states, but the rest of the world. Um, but, but we have to make sure that it's deep enough. We have to make sure that the biggest vessels can come up and we have the container uh, terminals uh, there uh, that we need uh, to service the middle third of the country. And by the way, that we know in the long term, that's anti-inflationary, uh, those, those sorts of investments. So this is going to give us an opportunity to do some things um, that we just would not be able to do otherwise. And, and my last point before, before I, I give up on this introductory comment is this is going to be transformational. And I pray that the bipartisan nature by which it became a reality also is going to be transformational and that this indicates that we can do more things uh, like this. And I know that ever since it passed, it seems like the two sides went back to their corners, but at least they know that it is possible today for them to come together in Washington and do really important work. I'm not sure it would have happened without some of the governors, Larry Hogan, principal among them, sorry about that, working so hard on those infrastructure initiatives and bringing governors, uh, senators, Congress people together, irrespective of party, to talk about what this infrastructure package really needed to look like at the end of the day. And guess what? That discussion that we had, that's what this bill looks like. So you did a great job, Larry. I thank you very much. You helped make it happen. Thank you for being part of that. Yeah. Well, that, that is such an important point, the, the bipartisan nature of this that we've not really seen before. And I think you're your, your comment is, is, is well taken and, and we should take to heart. That is to continue that bipartisan relationship. So that's the, that's the challenge. Governor? Thank you. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to thank, of course, the uh, National Governors Association for their leadership and uh, their persistence in getting us uh, governors all together uh, waking up at one in the morning so I can be part of the uh, <laughs> Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, also want to thank, uh, of course, the leadership of Governor Hogan. And now uh, Governor Hutchison has to take the ball down to the end of the uh, football field. Um, we are also very grateful for the generosity of the federal government and uh, the financial aid that we've gotten from uh, PUA, EIP, to um, uh, AR, ARP, to CARES Act, and now, of course, the infrastructure, the infrastructure bill. I also want to uh, let you know that uh, Guam's uh, saying is, Guam is where America's day begins because of our um, uh, zone timing differences. So I want Joe to know that I have the answers already, 18 <laughs> hours ahead of all of you. So, uh, you know, I, uh, we make this, we predicted the win in the uh, presidency way before uh, the last polling poll was closed. And I was trying to get a hold of uh, President uh, 
elect then Joe Biden to let him know to uh, relax because he's won, but he didn't take my call. So, uh, <laughs> but I also wanted to thank, uh, of course, President Biden and uh, Vice President Harris for uh, their passion and their compassion to uh, build back better and to put money into the hands of uh, the Americans and that uh, Guam has been included. And so is the CNMI has been included, uh, all the other territories. And it means a lot to us, although I don't have as many bridges as uh, <laughs> Governor Wolf and I don't have as many um, uh, land, uh, uh, mileage like he does, uh, but we do need the infrastructure bill. Uh, how we prioritize it is I have rolled out a uh, investment parahamzu is what we call it. And it's a rollout of the uh, investment plan uh, using ARP, CARES Act, and also uh, targeting on the infrastructure improvements. Uh, we categorized it and we prioritized it that, uh, based on what is the economic recovery that it will bring to us based on how uh, significant it is for climate resiliency, and then based on uh, building a medical healthcare complex, which during this pandemic has shown us that really our hospital was very fragile and uh, we're, we don't have the luxury of going to another state. We are way out uh, in the uh, Pacific Ocean between Asia and the United States. We're very much in the uh, um, mercy of Asian development and Asian countries. Um, and so we saw that medical, a very good state of the art medical complex will really uh, put that investment back into the hands of our people. So those are the three main uh, categories, Jane, that we have looked to prioritize. Our, economy is very much dependent on tourism and it's dependent on international travel. Uh, that's different from here in the United States where you have domestic uh, tourism. I know a lot of people go to Louisiana. I've been to your uh, New Orleans uh, Mardi Gras and had a nice time. Um, <laughs> I was not governor then, but, <laughs> but I was, uh, uh, I enjoyed my time in New Orleans. But anyway, uh, so we're very dependent in the Asian market. And uh, uh, when we look at our economy and our tourism and how it went from, you know, pre-COVID, very, very, very uh, over 1.5 million tourists, which is good for us, to zero. So we're also... Uh, looking at uh, economic diversity. And we're trying to bring in different uh, investors uh, and certainly having a uh, good safe road system, certainly having a good hospital care there and so forth would uh, entice and attract these investors. So that's how we've prioritized it. That's economic recovery, uh, climate resiliency, and then uh, having a, a good sound medical complex to put the investment into the hands of our people. Very good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I, first of all, let me say, Governor Hogan, thank you for hosting this week. It's, it's wonderful. You have been a leader in, in uh, infrastructure. It made a big difference. You. You, you were great help in getting this uh, passed. And I wanna thank the NGA for, for organizing this, this meeting. Uh, I'm governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, we're the fifth largest state in the country and we are the Keystone State. That means that just about every piece of anything coming out of the port of Baltimore or most of the ports on the East Coast that are going anywhere to the West have to come through Pennsylvania. So there are three main interstates going East to West, uh, 76, 80 and the New York Thruway. I used to say that two of those three come through Pennsylvania, someone corrected me. The third New York three-way actually comes through Pennsylvania too, because it has to come up around here. So this infrastructure bill is of huge importance to us. We really need to make sure that, that our roads, our bridges, uh, and as Secretary Gramian pointed out, I think we have the third largest number, of, third highest number of bridges in the United States. Um, we need to make sure those roads and those bridges actually work. And then there are all the other things in the infrastructure bill, like every other state, 
we need broadband. We need to make sure that everybody is served <clears throat> in rural areas as well as urban as well as urban areas. Uh, but anybody, everybody in the 21st century needs to be uh, connected with the the, uh, the internet. Broadband is, is is the key. Our water systems. Uh, we need to make sure that that our uh, uh, electric grid uh, is uh, 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 up to speed. We need, need to make sure that, that we have the cybersecurity we need in this age of, of the connectedness. All these things are so important to everybody in the United States, but I think there's nowhere uh, that, that needs this more than Pennsylvania. We, we absolutely need all the things that, that this bill brings. Uh, and it's why uh, I was one of your strongest supporters in lobbying for this because this really is important. Um, I know there's some folks who look at something like this and say, we, we really uh, shouldn't be spending this amount of money, but we have been putting this off for far too long, decades. And I was in business before I took this job. Uh, this is my seventh year in politics. Uh, and there was never anything that anybody came to me and said, we could do something, we could make an investment here, we might have to borrow money to do it, but we can make an investment here that was gonna produce a much bigger return for us. There is nothing that we can do as a, as a nation uh, than to, to invest, to make this investment, no matter how we get this money, to invest in increased productivity. We are cheating ourselves if we don't do this. And so I am very, very proud of Joe Biden, President Biden, uh, and very thankful for, and grateful for what you and the rest of the National Governors Association have done to make sure that we make this really important investment for our future. We need this. Thank you very much. Well, that's, um, um, I think it's really exciting to hear that you've already targeted or already begun to think about areas where you know that you're going to need uh, the, the funding that will be available. Someone mentioned to me that there are actually 59 new programs mentioned in the bill. I have not looked at it in that detail, but that's an, uh, a big number. That's a uh, certainly a big change than what we've seen before. I do understand that the uh, and uh, that the government, uh, the DOT will be and energy will be uh, issuing guidance first, as opposed to regulation, which I think is encouraging because that will allow us to begin to understand what the criteria will be and how to respond to that. So that's that's really positive. But thinking in terms of some of those uh, new programs, you've mentioned broadband. Are there others that you've heard about or that you uh, that your staff has talked about where you think? We've got to really uh, focus on that and really spend some some time some time with it. First of all, let me just touch on a some a couple of things that some of my colleagues do. I want to thank Governor Edwards and Governor Wolf, who were a big part of this bipartisan infrastructure initiative, and thank all of our fellow governors who aren't with us today. The governors came together, Republicans and Democrats, and NGA supported and pushed this from the beginning, and it really it really I think had a big impact on making it happen. A lot of the things, everything that we put in our NGA initiative that all the governors came to agreement on uh, ended up in the final bill, yeah. which is great. There's a lot of programs that can help us. Governor Wolf touched on on um, broadband, which is big. You know, we, prior to this, have invested $400 million in trying to get broad, broadband to every single person who doesn't have access to high-speed internet. But this is gonna help us, you know, supercharge that. A lot of the programs we've been working we now are able to move forward or move up in the priority list. One of the things that our uh, initiative, NGA, uh, pushed for was cyber, which ironically was not in the Republican bill or in the White House bill. Neither the Democrats or the Republicans were talking about cyber, which, you know, we're the cyber capital of America here in Maryland, at home to the NSA and U.S. Cyber Command. This is critically important to every state, federal, state, and local government agency, to every private sector business, and it is infrastructure, you know. So, we, we got Republicans to agree to add things into the bill that they didn't, it was not roads and bridges and tunnels and airports, uh, like some green energy stuff, like resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Democrats to say limit, let's not put all the social stuff in the one bill. Let's just talk about things where we're actually protecting the grid, you know, uh, taking care of coastal flooding, um, you know, fixing all of the transportation infrastructure, clean water systems. You know, it, it really was a collapse. We talk about the bipartisan bill, the bipartisan bill, it truly was. We had to tr kind of drag both sides mm -hmm. to yeah. the middle. I think the Republicans started out at like 600 million, just, you know, roads and bridges and tunnels. And the Democrats, I mean, we were at, you know, multiple times what this was with a separate bill. And the president smartly 
agreed to say, let's try to get the bill done uh, where we can find agreement in a bipartisan way. And that's what happened. And I wanna thank all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle for helping and our friends in Congress who had the courage to stand up and do it in spite of tremendous pressure from actually both sides, both leaderships that this deal got done from the middle out. Um, and I, we started out the conversation saying, um, maybe this is uh, something that we should be trying to do in the future. I think all of us sitting on this stage really believe a lot in common sense bipartisan solutions. It's what NGA is all about, bringing people together to fix problems. It's what governors are really good at. It's what Washington is not so good at. <laughs> and so, I mean, this is like the first time that I can remember in a long, long time that uh, instead of just pointing fingers and arguing back and forth that we sat down and hammered out an agreement on something really important uh, to all of our states and to everybody in America. So I guess we ought to be working at NGA with all these smart governors about what's our next mission? You know, what else can we get done in Washington in a bipartisan way? Because I think it's really important. It is. Mm -hmm. I think I think the next thing, and it gets back to a point you made a few minutes ago, Larry, and that is how are we going to spend this? How are we going to actually allocate it in, in a rational way? I'd like to make a suggestion. You know, the three things that I think we, we need to look at, we want to get the money out fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we need to be uh, deliberate and do this right, but I think we, we, we need to, there's a, a, a real need to fix our infrastructure to address that. Second thing is we need to make sure we avoid the, the traditional political gamesmanship that goes on in allocations of funds. We don't want to do a lot of bridges to nowhere. Uh, we don't want to make decisions on allocating resources based on uh, uh, projects whose sole virtue is that they happen to be near very powerful politicians' home. Uh, and the final thing, I think we want to make sure that we do something that, that is sustainable. This is five to 10 years. That's a long time. I, it's, you and I are both in our last years as governor of, of our state, um, but 10 years is not a long time in the life of a, of a state. And, and so we've got to figure out how uh, the money that we're investing here uh, survives this five to 10 year period. We may not be this lucky again, maybe another four decades before the federal government steps up. So we need that. We also need to figure out ways, I think, to attract other dollars. People talked uh, earlier about public private partnerships. Um, we're going to be getting a lot of money. You're getting, all, we're all getting a lot of money uh, from this, um, but it's not going to it's not an infinite amount of money and it's not nearly what um, the engineers are saying we need to, to address our uh, infrastructure gaps. Um, so we need something, some way that we can attract private sector money to augment uh, what we've gotten from the federal government here. So I'd propose something that, that, that looks like a special purpose authority that most states, if not all states have set up in one way or another that, that serves sort of like a, an infrastructure bank where uh, you, can, you can actually pool the resources that you have, the human resources, the expertise you need, uh, but also uh, use the money that comes from the federal government uh, to leverage other money uh, so that you have this money into the future. Um, I've spreadsheeted something like this because this is the kind of thing I love doing. Uh, and and it, it, a state like Pennsylvania could actually generate hundreds of millions of dollars each year in net profits by just doing very, um, uh, 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 I think, important uh, projects. A bank like this would, would have a board that, that would actually make the uh, projects uh, accountable. They'd have to work. They couldn't be bridges to nowhere. They'd have to be bridges to somewhere. Uh, and, and I think it's the kind of thing that, that uh, uh, within a very short time, uh, we could actually become self-sufficient. And we could That's actually look at look at infrastructure as something that would survive this really good bill. Right. I, I totally agree with uh, Tom in the issue of sustainability. I think implementation we've got, I think we've got implementation down pat, right? Public private partnership, um, working with other uh, people, collaborating, cooperatives, uh, communicating relationships and so forth. But I think the harder part, at least for uh, our island, is how do we sustain it? And not just sustain, but how do we become more self-sufficient? So we're not so much dependent on, uh, like you said, maybe 10 years from now, we might not get, we may, we may not get 
uh, the federal monies or the help. And so what we're doing in Guam is, I like your bank uh, idea too, um, but what we're doing in Guam is we, uh, I've um, formed a economic diversification uh, commission. And what we're doing is we're looking at, okay, so we're here located geographically. We are the uh, first line of national security defense. We have a lot of military activities in Guam. Uh, they are, we have a lot of construction going on in Guam. So that's a source of economic uh, revenues, new revenues. But more importantly is we are geographically located where we can take uh, advantages of the need for a redundant telecommunications in the world. So Asia goes up north to the United States. They're looking now for an alternative source, which is uh, going to be redundancy. And so we're saying Guam is the place. First of all, I think our laws are in order. We are a stable government. We are connected very much to the United States. The standards of practice are very good. And so we are in, uh, actually, we have a lot of landing cables now coming from Asia. So we're trying to also uh, stand up a very robust data, warehousing data center. Uh, we're trying to um, attract Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon to be, uh, to use us as their tool and their, and their avenue and conduit. Um, additive manufacturing, that's one thing that we are really pursuing. Uh, because of our very fragile supply chain. And also um, the military is there. So with additive man uh, manufacturing, they can, uh, they can uh, establish the parts right there. Have you ever seen that, Larry? The they say you can build a house with additive manufacturing. And so uh, we're uh, working with uh, companies that would be interested to come to Guam to work on. My point is, I think we need to be very creative and innovative in uh, economic attraction and diversification of industries. The other thing that's my biggest pet peeve is aquaculture. I want Guam to be the center of aquaculture. There are billions of billions of money in that industry. Um, and we, do, we would get food security if we, if we do that then we would be self-sustained in terms of economic um, uh, stabilization and economic uh, solid, solidification for our sufficiency. And, and Governor, you would see, I think, potential in the bill to, to advance some of those goals. That's yes, correct. I like the, the past, um, gave me a really good idea, the past panel, when they said, uh, take what it says there and make it, make your program so it meets that. Oh, okay, aquaculture decreases carbon monoxide, I, I mean, carbon dioxide, right? Carb we don't have manufacturers to make up all these products. We don't emit uh, uh, emission into the air. So aquaculture, I think, will fit into the carbon dioxide uh, eligibility. I think you're onto something. Yeah, yeah. I think you are. Yeah. That's great. Governor Edwards, talk a little bit about the resiliency and so forth. I know, uh, as you mentioned, that's such a challenge for your state. Do you see some potential here and how might you be thinking? About oh, no, that? We, we absolutely do. So we, we have, without a doubt, the most robust science based climate adaptation uh, program anywhere in the country where we're investing in a minimum of $50 billion over 50 years. Uh, to do uh, projects that both restore the coast, but also offer more protection. Um, and I gave you the bad news a while ago with land loss. The good news is with the, when the projects are completed that are already completed, those that are under design, those in the construction, for the first time in decades, we will be building more land in Louisiana than we're losing. Wow. But you have to have the resources to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not just money, you got to have the workforce and uh, you, it has to be science-based and, and all of these things, but the resiliency component is all about that. The other, the other thing is, you know, we know that this works. Hurricane Ida took a very similar path to Hurricane Katrina. 
it was stronger than Hurricane Katrina. You didn't see all of the things around New Orleans that you saw uh, with Hurricane Katrina because of the infrastructure investments that have happened since then. Very generous, and we thank you all, for over $14 billion for the most complex set of levees and floodgates and pumps and, and you name it. But we know that they work, right? I mean, it's not just theoretical anymore. It absolutely works. And those protecting systems are needed in more areas, and they're already being built across uh, South Louisiana. And so the, the emphasis on uh, resiliency, I think, is, is, is spot on from our perspective. You know, what can we do to make sure that the, that the lights don't go out? And if they do go out, that we can get them back on quicker. And it's not just about your comfort um, with air conditioning, although that's important in South Louisiana when these hurricanes yeah. hit in, in August. Uh, but when you have uh, hospitals that can't stay open because their, their water systems fail, um, or they, they've already received damage themselves, and then they lose power. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, the last two years, they were full with COVID patients. Mm -hmm. And so, so making that whole system more resilient, um, there's a lesson to be learned. There was a part of New Orleans that never lost power. So it's got a microgrid that's, that's fueled by solar. Never lost its power. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we have to do more things like this. Some of this will be available to us because of this bill. Hopefully uh, other parts of that will come later, but incredibly important for us. And while we may be the canary in the coal mine, these problems are growing all around the country, uh, all on the East Coast, the West Coast. And, and I, I think we're gonna have an exportable commodity with the experience and the expertise that we're developing in Louisiana now as we deal with these challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You no, know, they, they spoke earlier about the, 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 the reports that go to Congress. And, and I think one of them is, is, has to do with best practices. I've heard some best practices already mm -hmm. up here. I mean, this is it's terrific with what you're doing in these states. I, yeah, I just want to follow up on Governor Wolf's comment about private sector investment. I think that's critically important. It's something that we're big believers in that we've been doing in Maryland for seven years. <clears throat> but it was also a big part of our NGA infrastructure initiative in the summits that we held around the country. And we also did them in Australia, where they do a really good job of utilizing P3's private sector investment to get big infrastructure projects done. I think you know, he had a unique part of it when he was talking about infrastructure banks, but just the whole idea that there really are, in addition to this federal money, an un almost unlimited amount of investment dollars that wants to invest in infrastructure projects that we need to leverage and capitalize on and use this as the catalyst to do even more uh, that's not just relying on taxpayers' money. And we've, you know, we've done that here. We talked a little bit earlier about, you know, we have a public-private partnership at the Port of Baltimore to help to stretch the port. That's helping us increase productivity and put people to work. We're, we're doing a public-private partnership on the Purple Line, which is the largest, you know, light rail project tying into metro Washington area. We're that's, doing a public-private- That's why private, you wore that tie, right? That's why well, this is a Raven's tie, but it's also the Purple Line and it's the NJ colors, you know, <laughs> bringing red and blue together. <laughs> uh, but yeah, on our highway, uh, our, we're connecting with Virginia and the Capitol Beltway. That's public-private partnership. There's investment dollars coming in from the private sector, and there's money. Uh, you know, Australia does a ton of this. So Canada does a ton of it. There are other countries in South America that do. We're not doing a good job of leveraging private sector investment. It's one of the major emphasis that we put in the NGA uh, Chairs Initiative, and it was in our recommendations to Congress, and it is, uh, there is P3 wor wording in this final bill, which there was not before. So I think it, it, we, we, that was one where we sort of had disagreement, where I think it was some, some more of the Republican colleagues were saying they were believed in private sector invest. Some of my Democratic friends were, were saying we should be using federal. It's, we should be doing both. And I think that's where we all came down to. And now a lot of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, like Governor Wilber saying, yeah, we should lever, tap well, into that. I think one of the problems, and, and Secretary Grandian brought this up, we, we, we have a, a challenge in Pennsylvania that, that I think we're all in a state of denial that the way we have funded transportation uh, investment in the past is through the fossil fuel tax. Well, cars and trucks are getting more fuel efficient. By 2035, General Motors says they're not even going to make an internal combustion engine. So if that's the way we're funding our infrastructure, we do have, I guess, registration fees and a few other things. But basically, it's through the, a, 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 a series of cash flows that are coming in less and less. So it's, hard to, problem, it's hard to fund everything on the gas tax when you have no gas. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, and even <laughs> if you do and no one's using it, it's really hard to do it. 
So, so the, the, uh, uh, the problem is that, that we don't want to uh, face that fact. It's a hard fact that, that yeah. we have a, something that is not uh, uh, providing the funding uh, and we don't want to do the alternative. So the federal government makes it hard to pull highways. Uh, the federal government makes it hard to do the things to create the cash flows that would allow the private sector to say, I, I see some virtue in investing here. I just, for the record, want to say that my own personal preference would be to have roads and bridges done for free. Okay. Everybody on there? <laughs> I have yet, and the secretary and I have been looking for a contractor who would give us roads and bridges. And we have not yet found one. And so we have to come up with some alternative. And it would be helpful, I think, with this infrastructure thing is what the next thing is. And one of the next things is we're going to have to figure out how we create that cash flow that invites private sector investment create the cash flow that provides both the federal and state governments with the funding we need uh, to make sure that we have uh, an infrastructure future because based on what we're doing, the way we're doing it now, we, we don't have a future. I agree. And by the way, the, the free infrastructure, I call that the Easter Bunny approach. It has not worked. It's not working. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Jane, I, I, I want to get to what you, you, you mentioned a while ago and, and Governor Hogan mentioned that we need an all of the above approach so that when these dozens of new programs, when the rules are really written, first of all, they need to be written and then left alone. If they can give us preliminary guidance so we can start planning between now and then, that would be great. And the rules have to have the flexibility so that we can do all of the above as it works for us. I don't have the population density or the vehicle density across my state to do what Larry's done. But we have some projects that we can do with public-private partnerships. We now have a history with this because we have the first uh, bridge and tunnel replacement being done through a, a, a P3 in our state's history that we started a couple of years ago. We, we, so we've cut our teeth on it. We know how to do this. And, and if we're ever going to build a new uh, bridge uh, in Baton Rouge along I-10 that connects uh, Los Angeles, California with the east coast of Florida, uh, I can tell you the public, the private sector is going to have to play a, a part in that. And so I'm, I'm hopeful, optimistic that the rules won't be written in a way that prevent us from taking advantage of that opportunity. Otherwise, I don't know how we will deliver that project because that's a $2 billion project in and of itself. Um, and we can contribute towards it. But if, if we have to do that project without the private sector, I don't know how it ever gets done. And, and keep in mind, I think that's that's the key point. You're not asking the private sector to do everything. But we just need to stop the public sector from doing everything. Right. We, we I, need to bring, bring I will put resource public funding. resources there to buy the cost of the project down so so that if there's a toll, that it's it's as short as it can be and it's as low as it can be. But they have to be at the table. And P3s are not P3s. That, that you know, business plan doesn't work where they just give you something, right? And so, so anyway, we're... We, we're hopeful and optimistic. And the other point I want to make is I've directed all of my cabinet agencies who have any part uh, to play uh, in the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Don't wait till the rules come out. Contact your counterparts in the federal government today and tell them what you want the rules to say, because they may not even see it from your perspective and you're less likely to be disappointed. And so hopefully all the states are going to do that. And then we're going to get very flexible rules. I want to Amen. second every single thing Governor yeah. Evers just said. That's probably the most important stuff we've heard all day. We've got to have the flexibility. People, we have to make these decisions long in advance. We can't be changing the rules. They can't be too complex. We've got to have clarity and we've got to have lots of flexibility because the states are the ones responsible for actually doing the infrastructure. We don't need the federal government tying our hands. We need them to, we want to accomplish what they need to get done, but we need their, they have to be our partner. And sometimes we have seen, you know, the rulemaking uh, complication screws up the whole process. So right. the bill's great. The details in, in the regulations are going to be really important. Right. It's the implementation that's the challenge. So that's great advice. You know, make make the guidance clear. It gives enough flexibility to the states. Is there a role for NGA in pulling together all of these sort of great ideas? The bank, you know, the the issue about how do you you know keep uh, diversify and uh, your your economy and so forth. Is there a role for, for, for NGA with that? I, you know, I, I think absolutely. And, uh, you know, the NGA staff does an incredible job. Um, you know, we, we, we all, the governors, it's a great resource for us. And I think gathering, you know, all of the input from uh, us uh, around the states and territories about things that we're concerned about or things that they should be addressing or that 
we want in or out of the regs. Uh, NGA, I think, is, is during COVID, you know, we, we all got together and shared all of our thoughts and best practices. We were talking constantly. This is probably another time where we ought to be all talking yeah. and gathering and sharing right. best practices and information. And I'm concerned about this, or how are you guys dealing with that? And conveying that. So I think NGA should I think help so us. Too. I that. think for me, I see NGA as the strong voice of all the governors. And, you yeah. know, uh, President Biden did say that uh, it's the state governors that's going to make this happen. That's right. And so I think that's a strength that we should all leverage. And I think NGA does a really good job in being uh, uniting all of us and uh, um, uh, going forward, not just to the White House, but to Congress. And uh, I know that uh, the, the governors, and we don't have a representative that votes. We don't have um, you know, a Senate because we're not a state. We are a US territory. So we don't have uh, as much a strong voice as my other colleagues here through their senators and through your House of Representatives. But certainly NGA for me has been a very uh, strong driver and influence like Look how we were discussing about the ARP. And one of the things that we wanted is for the governors to have discretionary power over the ARP. And that happened, right? We were given, and, it, and I'll tell you, my, my senators in Guam are very upset because they <laughs> cannot appropriate uh, the $596 million that was given to us. And so, but that's what, that's what NGA was constantly saying. You were constantly saying that, uh, Larry, whenever we had any meetings with the White House. I remember that because that was one of the things that I was always looking at. They didn't always like it when I said that. I know, but uh, it's just the point <laughs> is that yes, NGA does have a very strong role to play in this whole, not just for the infrastructure bill, but also for the Build Back Better bill and other uh, bills that are very beneficial to the people. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Guam might not have a senator or a vote in Congress, but they got a great governor. So oh, make yeah. up for it. <laughs> <Make> <laughs> up for it. Well, I am looking at the clock, which uh, wasn't working for a while, and now is working. We've got about five about five minutes yet up left, and I'm, I'm going to turn to the governors and ask for some last thoughts. But I hope before you go, uh, at least one of you will comment on on how do we keep this bipartisan, uh, you know, that sense of bipartisanship going. Is there a way? I mean, you guys have done an incredible job of that, and it was really heartening for those of us who were watching the bill and watching the discussions to see that role that you played in pulling people together. But final thoughts. I, I really believe that NGA is the, is the catalyst to all of that. I, I've said this before, I showed up at my first, I call it baby governor school, but it's the conference for the seminar for new governors. And I met all these governors uh, and I didn't really know all the governors. You know, I hadn't been in politics either like Tom, I had never held office before. And I, I didn't really know who were Democrats and Republicans, and you couldn't tell because they weren't wearing, you know, blue and red jerseys. And every one of them was sharing, you know, how they were getting things done in their states, the problems that they had. And that's why I've stayed so involved in this group and got on the executive committee, why I wanted to be involved in leadership of the group. It, I really believe that NGA has, we, we don't always agree. Of course, we're, I don't agree with my wife on everything, but you know, we get along. <laughs> really well and we do cooperate better than they do in the house or the senate or in most state legislative bodies and i think we can set an example um, you know but we have to push washington yes. to be more bipartisan mm -hmm. and this is one kind of perfect example that it is possible but it's still the exception to the rule and we've got to figure out how we can continue the momentum from this to get some more things done in washington together working across the aisle, I, I think like we do as governors. I think one of the things is that, that it's the National Governors Association does a phenomenal job, but I think the, the act, the role of governor as, as an executive rather than a legislator puts us in a different position. We are more practical. We have to get things done. Uh, and so I know, um, I think I know you do, I think we all work with uh, legislatures that are of the opposite party. Uh, and yet we've gotten things done. 
uh, and we, we, we can. So I think there, there's maybe a greater spirit of bipartisanship out there uh, than we're led to believe uh, because states do get things done uh, at the state level, at the county level, at the local level. Uh, and some of the dysfunction, I think, is maybe a little bit over, overblown. But, but uh, the governor's position by in and of itself, I think, lends to that kind of bipartisanship. And I think the National Governors Association bringing yeah. people, executives together, uh, actually uh, maybe helps that spirit. Yeah. I, think, I think Tom is right. I, having been a member of the state legislature and now governor, I, if, if you're one of 105 members of the House, which is what I was in Louisiana, or if you're one of 39 senators there, or if you're one of 435 members of the House of Representatives of Washington, or 100 senators, you're not personally responsible for the success or failure of anything. You're not. And you can always justify your vote against as it wasn't the best or whatever. But when you're the one and only governor, nothing happens if you take that approach. Right. Uh, and I and I have I've lived both of those lives now, and I will have been a, a legislator for eight years and a governor for eight years. Um, and so, what we need is is for people in Congress uh, to really not use that, not take that approach, and feel like they're personally responsible for making things happen. Otherwise, it becomes too easy for them to just say, "No, this bill isn't perfect. It isn't exactly what I wanted." And my voters aren't going to hold me to account because I got a district that I absolutely don't have to worry about. Right. That that leads to to I think too much dysfunction. But the bright spot, the bright spot over the last several years has been this bill, and so maybe this points the way forward. I think uh, I think everyone's right up here, but also uh, I feel that the, our constituents, the people in our states. And I think the leaders of Washington, D.C. and the White House should also have this attitude that it's the people of the nation that's going to benefit. And it doesn't really matter whether you are a Democrat or a Republican. I always say I ran as a Democrat, but when I won, I'm the governor for everybody, mm -hmm. not just the Democrats. So I think with that kind of attitude about uh, it's going to benefit the constituents, and how is it going to? It's going to benefit this way. Therefore, we have to work together. I know it sounds simple, right? But just doing it is hard work. But uh, I think it was done through NGA, and I think it would go forward. I think this bill also is going to be so. The outcome is going to be so great that people are going to start thinking that way. I think. I predict that because you know. Guam is where America's day begins. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, let me let me thank all of the governors very much. This was a, a good discussion, and I think uh, we've got a lot ahead of us. But uh, it certainly gives you a de high degree of confidence to listen to the comments that you've made. And I'm delighted to say that we are finishing two seconds ahead of schedule, <laughs> just like the aviation system. All right.